Hey guys, um, I am going to give you a very, hopefully very brief <laughs> lecture on um, neuroimaging. Uh, this is obviously not everything you need to know about neuroimaging, which is a very complex topic. Um, and if you've looked at the chapters in uh, the texts that I recommended, you can definitely see that. Um, it's a little overwhelming. Um, I just wanted to go through some of the basics uh, that you need to know to kind of make sense of what you're seeing. We're very likely to have another video um, uh, on neuroimaging if we don't get to everything here. Um, and uh, we're also going to be going through some neuroimaging as part of our uh, Thursday afternoon cases. So you get some practice looking at images and seeing what you see. Um, so with that, uh, let me pull up slides. Um, and I, I apologize. Um, there is a fair amount of this talk that is pretty basic. Um, and so we will whiz through those. This is a talk um, that I often give to um, PA students um, who don't uh, get as much radiology background as, as we might in medicine. Okay, so basic game plan. Um, one thing I want to kind of hammer in is that when you are discussing imaging, um, requesting imaging, um, or, or uh, going through it, consulting with a radiologist or somebody else, uh, you sound a whole lot smarter and capable if you know some of the lingo. Um, that can really take you a long ways using the professional kind of language. And so um, it's been a little while since we've thought about all of this. And so let's get used to using these terms. Sagittal. This is a sagittal view of the brain. This is an MRI. This is great to show you midline structures. This bright structure here well, that is the corpus callosum, um, and corpus callosum is a white matter tract, you remember. Um, in demyelinating diseases like multiple sclerosis, uh, you can frequently see lesions in the corpus callosum. So look for those if, you're, um, if you have a sagittal uh, MRI like this. Um, it's also useful for looking at things in the posterior fossa here. You can see that you can see nicely the brain stem and the cerebellum and the um, uh, cisterns and ventricles here as well. Sagittal. So remember sagittal. Um, remember coronal. Coronal as if the patient is looking at you. Comes from the Latin root for crown. Um, and so this is, uh, of course, coronal view here. Look at how nice you can see some of the midline structures. So here you've got the um, uh, the uh, lateral ventricles here, the septum pellucidum. This is a good sequence to look for things like atrophy, um, other things too, but um, here you can appreciate that this patient has quite a bit of atrophy um, in that you can see these huge sulci here. So um, coronal, very useful. So remember coronal, remember sagittal, and then of course axial. Axial is the one we probably will use the most and probably the one you're most familiar with. This is also an MRI, nose in the air, um, and we'll go through lots of axial imaging. So try to get used to using those terms as much as you can. Um, this is a little point that probably is obvious to everyone, but took me a while to figure out. Left is right and right is left when you're looking at images um, like this. And uh, sometimes it's labeled, sometimes not. Um, but it's just a, a um, factor of how the patient goes into the gantry. If you kind of think of it like that from the patient's perspective, it makes sense. All right, whizzing along. This is um, a second time I'm going to get up on my soapbox, and that is that if you find yourself, assuming um, that you are not going into a neuro field, um, uh, you're probably going to be in the um, position of needing to discuss um, with a specialist, a radiologist, or a neuroradiologist what kind of studies you may need, and these can get, be quite um, complex um, and there can be a lot of different options and so um, if you are ordering a neuro study you're not a neuro professional maybe not emergency medicine and you're kind of uh, hedging on what you should get uh, that's a good opportunity to talk to your radiologist your um, radiology technician perhaps also your radiologist or, or neuro um, surgeon um, to kind of find out what would be the best sequences and the best study um, and um, that's just true for everything, no matter what you're going into. If you're ordering something kind of specialized, it's good to 
be able to communicate um, with the person who's doing the study or reading the study. The other thing that's useful, especially in neuro and probably, I'm sure, way so in other uh, fields as well, is uh, communicating um, appropriately what it is you need um, because that will influence the study you get. So for example, in neuro, um, we've talked a little bit about demyelinating disease a few slides ago. Um, the the sequences you get for demyelinating disease are going to be a little different than the sequences you get for stroke. So letting the technologist, the radiologist, know what you're looking for can um, get you the right study. Okay, CT. So we're going to start with CT. We're going to go over MRI. Um, and again, depending on how much time this takes, I might break it up into two talks just because this is a lot of information. Um, so CT, again, remember to use your, te your terms um, intelligently. So CT, if you remember this, CT measures density. So you remember the Hounsfield units, you're looking at density. CT is, of course, radiation, um, and as such, you uh, uh, have some pros and cons as to when you uh, may use this study. For example, in children, we try to avoid CTs because of the cumulative effects of radiation um, over the lifetime. So sometimes uh, in pediatrics, we might get an MRI, where in adults, we might get a CT. Um, it is a great study for trauma, um, and if you've done ER or spent time uh, in the emergency uh, medicine, uh, you know that. So you can get a patient in and out of a scanner very quick. So if they're unstable, if they're fidgeting around, um, you know, it's a great study for that. It's also a great study for acute blood, and so, you know, it becomes our go-to imaging for stroke which we'll talk about more later. So density, remember dense. And so when you speak about something on CT, you know, you don't necessarily need to know what it is, but if you refer to the degree of density, you're gonna sound really smart. So we talk about hyperdense things, things that are denser than um, the ambient tissue, things that are hypodense and things that are isodense. So let's look at that. So here's a hyperdensity, right? This happens to be acute blood. And so these are the densest things. These are the least dense things. You're going to see an awful lot of acute blood um, and some subacute blood, too, um, in neurosurgery. You're also going to see a lot of CSF. And if you want to know what CSF looks like, look at this. Look at the ventricles. You know, So it's uh, quite um, dark, um, hypodense. Uh, just like um, water. <laughs> and so uh, things that are really hypodense are air. So up here in the sinuses, you can appreciate some air. Sometimes after a surgery, you can see pneumocephalus um, or air within the uh, 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 brain or within the uh, uh, cranium. Um, so just remember this, and we'll get a lot of practice with this. Calcified structures, too. So calcified structures are very dense, right? Makes sense. Look at the skull. This is how you can tell uh, that you are looking at a CT and not an MRI. Um, sometimes it gets a little confusing, right? <laughs> Which, what kind of a study is this? If you see this big, bright skull, super bright, dense skull, you know that you are in um, CT territory. We'll talk about what this little dude is in a minute. So, well, let's talk about it now. So there are some structures in the brain that calcify, sorry, and that are totally normal to calcify, sorry. Um, one is um, the pleasures of working from home. So one of them is uh, these structures. Um, and so you have one in each ventricle. The ones in the lateral ventricles can become um, larger and can calcify with age. And so these are the choroid plexus. And uh, again, in the lateral ventricles, in the posterior horns of the lateral ventricles, you can often see them calcified. Um, normal, normal. Um, sometimes you can't see them. Sometimes one looks different than the other, and that may be because of the way the patient's tipped. And so we'll see lots of those. Get used to them. Um, sometimes they can give you a clue that something is wrong if they get pushed over to one side or another. Same with this structure, which is the pineal gland, calcifies with age. And so uh, don't let that trick you. Um, uh, this here, just uh, while we're looking at it, is the uh, vermis of the cerebellum. So just that uh, uh, we're just seeing part of the cerebellum there. Um, in the midline uh, part of the cerebellum is called the vermis, which is Latin uh, for a uh, little worm, I think. And it looks kind of wormy. Okay, so gray matter, white matter, you remember this. It's somewhere deep in the recesses of your memory. We just need to 
dig that out a little bit. But um, you, we talk about gray matter, white matter. So this gray matter up here, cortex, and then there's some of these deep gray matter structures like the um, basal ganglia. You remember basal ganglia here in the thalamus. Um, and then these white matter tracts. Um, and then you can imagine those on a CT, right? And so uh, if we go back a couple, it so turns out that gray matter is actually denser than white matter. That makes sense. And then as such, we'll see that the gray matter is hyperdense compared to the white matter. Makes sense, right? Okay, blood. So blood. Hyper, hyperdense um, uh, uh, blood is acute blood. So here's hyperdense acute blood. This is a subdural hematoma. You're going to see, you've probably already seen a lot of these on your rotation. Other things you want to notice about this scan that might be more subtle that I want you guys to start looking at. Um, so if you look at this scan, yeah, there's this um, hyperdense blood over here, um, extra axial. So we'll talk, I think, later about how um, subdural hematomas, epidural hematomas are outside the surface of the brain. They're extra axial hemorrhages. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell if something's a subdural or an epidural, even for the surgeons. Um, and um, all you have to say in that respect is they're extra axial. And that's along the lines of sounding um, intelligent as you communicate about things. Um, so we'll talk about that more as we talk about things like meningiomas. Anyway, other things to notice here. So there's some mass effect. Mass effect is another term I'd like you guys to get com uh, comfortable with. Sorry, let me expand this. Sorry. Um, and so uh, there's mass effect. How do we know? Well, look, um, one, the uh, lateral ventricle, the right lateral ventricle is what we call a faced. You can make out the lateral ventricles. Here's the right, there's the left lateral ventricle, and then the posterior horn is completely a faced on the right. Um, that's a marker of mass effect. This can produce hydrocephalus, right, potentially. Um, there's also, if you look, some midline shift uh, noted here. So this here is a dura. So this is the falx. So maybe you remember the falx is that kind of... Uh, say longitudinal, I won't say longitudinal, but that um, uh, that um, reflection of the dura that goes from the front of the brain to the back. And it should be a nice line, right? A nice straight line. It's not. You've got some midline shift, and you can actually measure it from where the um, sep or the dura, the falx is supposed to be to where the falx is. You can also measure it um, uh, here. We can't really see the septum pellucidum because things are so effaced, but here is the septum pellucidum on this separate scan, different patient. Um, you can actually line it up with the falx up here and down here, and you can actually, if you have a cursor that measures, as you do on many programs when you're looking at scans, uh, you can actually measure the degree of midline shift by looking at the, uh, the degree of shift between where the septum pellucidum is and where the um, falx is. Um, I should also point out sometimes the, the falx calcifies with age, so sometimes it's very hyperdense, um, and that's okay. So uh, other things to notice here, um, the sulci, it's a little hard to appreciate on this scan, but we'll see um, more so on other scans about how the sulci can get a, um, effaced. Um, so this shows it, but it's kind of subtle, so we'll look for that in other scans. This is a tricky one. You, um, if you're going into emergency medicine, burn this image into your brain. At first, so I give it here what's going on, um, but at first you look at this and you say, oh, it looks pretty good to me. Send the patient home. Um, but it's not. One is you see that I mentioned up here that we've got bilateral isodense subdural hematomas. And this, um, this uh, uh, is what happens to blood on a CT. For one, uh, you know, when it's acute like this, it gets hyperdense, and then if that blood stays there, as it can for relatively small subdural hematomas like this, um, it becomes isodense with age, so this is like a subacute subdural hematoma. And then over time, it becomes hypodense, and so it becomes more the density of water, or CSF, and then the proteinaceous stuff floats to the bottom. Remember, you're in a depend that's in a dependent position when you're laying down for a CT, so all the 
good protein stuff goes to the bottom and the serum goes to the top. So remember this. Remember this progression of blood. It's going to be the same whether it's a subdural hematoma, with whether it's an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Um, but remember, you go from hyperdense to hypodense. So this is chronic. This is um, subacute. This is acute. So the other tricky thing about this scan is that it reaches a level of isodensity. Iso relative to the brain tissue. So you can see, so these are the subdurals. There's one here, there's one there. Um, it's subtle, but what you can see is the uh, brain goes all the way out to here, and then it becomes, uh, the, the, the tissue here uh, becomes different in consistency, and that's because it's isodense blood. What you would like to see is the tissue of the brain going all the way out to the table of the skull, the sulci, whatnot, the gray-white. We don't see that here. And so you get this sneaky kind of isodense bilateral subdural hematoma. Because it's bilateral, we don't have a lot of um, midline shift. Um, we do have mass effect, but we don't have a lot of midline shift. And so, again, these guys can be very tricky. Um, what is this guy? Do you guys remember? Pineal gland, Descartes said it was the seat of the soul. So remember the pineal gland, remember the choroid plexus. We'll point those out. This is a CT we know from the bright um, skull. All of these are CTs. <laughs> We're talking about CT. Um, but the other thing to note about this scan is this is a post-contrast scan. And the reason you can tell is there's blood in some of the blood vessels there. So over here, again, our chronic subdural hematoma on the left. Um, mass effect. You can see um, it's uh, a little hard to see on this particular cut, but um, if we were able to scan up and down and move our cursor around, we would appreciate there's definitely some midline shift between where the falx goes and the septum pellucidum. Uh, again, we have an effaced, meaning smooshed, um, uh, right lateral ventricle. Um, and a little bit more you can appreciate on this scan. I'm spending a lot of time on this because these are subtle kinds of things I want you guys to look for when you're looking at CTs. Um, so on the right, um, right hemisphere, look at, you can see these sulci, you can see the insula, um, you can see some of the gray-white differentiation a little better, a lot better than you can on the left, right? You don't really see sulci. You don't really see, kind of start to get a hint of insula. But everything's just effaced here. Even the gray-white differentiation is, is blurred. So those are the things that you want to look for when you have a mass lesion in the head. Um, and so this is just a reminder of um, subdural versus epidural and how they behave differently. Um, and again, both are examples of extra-axial hemorrhages. Um, so here's a, a subdural hematoma. This patient has been previously, um, uh, presumably previously, maybe uh, not so previous, um, operated on because of this skull defect. But this is a right acute holohemispheric subdural hematoma. So uh, holohemispheric, it goes all through the hemisphere. Um, and uh, you remember that subdural hematomas are typically due to a tearing of the um, bridging veins. That's how it kind of becomes a disease of aging, if you think about it, because as your brain shrinks, as it does with age, you have more tug on those bridging veins and they can be more vulnerable. The other thing that happens as you get older is you're more likely to end up on blood thinners. Um, and the other thing is you're more likely to fall because of problems like balance from things like neuropathy or dizziness, whatnot, or orthostasis. And so subdural hematoma uh, really is um, a disease of aging. Sometimes we see it in young people, but um, uh, as you will see in this rotation, uh, you're going to see a lot of older patients with this. And um, as such, uh, so being under venous uh, flow, uh, they can get pretty big um, with the patient being minimally um, symptomatic. And so this is a good thing to remember if you're in a primary care clinic and you get an older patient, particularly an older patient who's prone to falls on blood thinners, and they're having headaches or they're just having these subtle kind of mental status changes, uh, you could have a subdural in there that could be chronic, could be subacute. So I tend to have a low threshold to image these patients. Um, on this side here, we've got an epidural hematoma. And you remember how epidural hematomas are a little bit different. They're under typically under arterial pressure, at least in this location. You can also get epidurals under venous um, 
uh, especially in the frontal region. But this is kind of the classic, you know, when you're studying boards and when you're, you know, seeing uh, a really dramatic patient, um, these are the classic. These are due to tear typically of the middle meningeal artery, maybe associated with a temporal bone fracture. Um, and uh, they can get very quickly, uh, they are very big very quickly. These are the talk and die kind of um, head injuries where the patient has a lucid period and then as this uh, epidural hematoma expands as the epi uh, uh, and you get more midline shift, you start to get uncle herniation, which we'll also talk about, you um, start to, uh, uh, you start to uh, have a really big problem and these patients may need emergent surgery. They do need emergent surgery to survive. A lot going on in this scan. Okay, let's go through it. Okay, CT, bright skull, right? Um, pineal gland, one of the choroid plexi. Uh, we know there should be another one in here somewhere. We've got this um, uh, uh, lens shape. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say lens shape. Biconvex, biconvex, acute hemorrhage here, right? Um, we can't really see the bones too well. Um, if we were looking at this scan on a, um, a, a program that allowed us to, we could um, switch to a bone window and see if there's an associated skull fracture there. But here it's a little hard to tell, at least for me. Um, so looking at our right hemisphere, this is more like what we want to see, right? Sulci, insula, gray-white differentiation. Over here, everything is effaced, right? Gray, white, you really can't see too much distinction. You can't see those sulci, you can't see the insula. Everything is, once again, that term effaced, including the lateral ventricle. So presumably the right or left lateral ventricle is in here somewhere, but it's um, definitely pushed over. Um, and uh, our septum pellucidum, the other kind of midline structure we look to, as well as the pineal, the pineal is pushed over, right? But the septum pellucidum is pushed over from where it should be under the faults. So this is a patient who's going to get into very big trouble and die if something's not done. Uncle herniation, um, we probably won't get to today, but we should talk about. So that's when you have, and we will talk about, that's when you have a mass lesion in the middle um, cranial fossa, and what can happen is you can get, um, uh, you remember, you can get um, so much mass effect that the lip of the temporal lobe, the um, uncus, uh, presses over and compresses the, uh, the midbrain. It can be a fatal, fatal injury. Um, okay, so interparenchymal hemorrhage. So how is this different from the other kind of hemorrhage we saw? That um, was subdural and epidural. Those are extraaxial, right? Outside the surface of the brain. These are inside. Boop, boop, boop. These are inside the surface of the brain, inside the tissue of the brain, intraparenchymal. So again, you know, try to get comfortable with these terms so that you can use them because you really will sound um, uh, more intelligent and more. Um, more like you get it <laughs> um, and more precise um, than if you just say blood in the head. Um, and that will be, of course, important as you're speaking to other professionals like consultants, if you're calling a neurosurgeon for a consult or whatnot. Okay, so intraparenchymal hemorrhage, intraparenchymal within the tissue of the brain. And these are all acute, right? Because our blood is bright, our blood is hyperdense. Um, so here we have a, a right frontal intraparenchymal hemorrhage. This would be what we call a lobar, meaning within the lobes of the brain, the, the cerebrum of the brain. Um, the, the, uh, kind of uh, along the cortical surface there. Um, these, uh, this um, is more of a deep hemorrhage. We call this more a deep intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Um, there's probably a better term for it that's not coming to me right now. Um, but um, there is a bit of a distinction um, between these low bar hemorrhages and these deep hemorrhages. Deep hemorrhages tend to be more likely due to hypertension, which is the leading cause for intraparenchymal hemorrhages, and they tend to happen deep. So the basal ganglia, the thalamus, deep white matter, um, pons, sometimes cerebellum. Low bar hemorrhages that tend to happen out toward the surface, toward the cortical surface, um, they can be due, due to different things. One of the things that we're increasingly recognizing as the cause of these low bar hemorrhages in elderly is amyloid angiopathy, where you get this buildup of amyloid within the uh, vessel wall and it makes the vessels kind of friable and prone to, um, prone to rupture. 
Um, you can also, of course, get hemorrhages of any kind if you have abrasion on blood thinners. So we'll talk more about that. Um, signs of mass effect, you guys can already pick this out, right? You can see there's a little bit of shift there. We can't see the septum pellucidum, but look at the falx is kind of bowing out a little bit there. Effaced ventricle. You might wonder if that's blood in the ventricle there. Sometimes we see that blood ruptures into the ventricles and you can see it flow through the ventricles. Um, it could be, it's a little hard to tell, or it could be a choroid plexus. Again, if we were able to scan back and forth on our radiology program, we'd be able to tell in a heartbeat. This is a, uh, so this is a right frontal, this is a left basal ganglia hemorrhage. Um, we're going to presume it's probably due to hypertension. Um, you can appreciate on both of these scans, there's a little bit of surrounding hypodensity, and that is edema. So hemorrhages swell, um, and they tend to swell in the first few days. And that, the swelling can really get you into trouble because you already have mass effect. If you add edema onto that, you can uh, get your patient in huge trouble. This, as a side note, is why um, we are so particular about IV fluids in our um, and electrolytes in our neuro patients. That goes for neurology and neurosurgery. If you have an intracranial process, especially one that causes mass effect, you do not want to drop your patient sodium, right? And you do not want to give your patient hypotonic fluids. And that's because this mass effect. And that's a little unique to some parts of the body um, in that in the brain we have this critical structure um, that is necessary for life. And it's in this hard box of a, a skull. You can see the skull is pretty formidable. Um, and so if you have edema, if you have mass effect like a hemorrhage, a tumor, in this vault here, um, the only way to go is down, and so herniation. And so we really have to be careful when we have a space-occupying lesion up in the brain. This one over here is a hemorrhage in the pons, which I told you is also a common location for hypertensive hemorrhage. This is presumably an older patient because you can see they're, they have some atrophy, some frontotemporal atrophy. All right, this definitely is an image to burn into your brain, no matter what you're going into. Just remember this. This is another kind of hemorrhage, right? This is subarachnoid hemorrhage. And how can you tell it's subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, it gets into those little sulci and cisterns, right? So you remember it's under the, the, the arachnoid level. And so it gets into all those little nooks and crannies like this. And so you can see it creep into sulci, cisterns. Cisterns are the spaces around the brain stem. So this is kind of a sneaky kind of a bleed. It can get all over the place. When you see it in this location, you sure got to be suspicious um, for a ruptured aneurysm, right? Because the circle of Willis is in here. Even here, odds are this is a ruptured aneurysm. So this is the big fear with um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially when it's in this location and it's so widespread. You worry that this is an um, aneurysm that ruptured and uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage can kill your patient. This is something you have to pick up if you're going to try to save this patient's life. Very different in some respects from other types of hemorrhage. The things that can kill this patient, um, very specialized. And so um, what you want to do if you see something like this, you must get vessel imaging ASAP. So that's probably going to be a CT angiogram. So you inject iodinated contrast, or somebody in the tech or the machine <laughs> injects iodinated contrast, and you can see the vessels, and you can see if there's an aneurysm there. Um, uh, the gold standard for looking at the blood vessels is a catheter angiogram. And so um, that is, of course, when you go in through the femoral, well, somebody goes in through the femoral artery, injects a dye, and you can actually um, directly, or you can visualize with great detail the um, blood vessels of the head. Um, so remember this, though. This is a patient you um, need to be worried about. The number one cause, all comers, for subarachnoid hemorrhage um, is actually trauma. And so if you uh, are seeing a lot of trauma scans, you'll note that there um, is subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, not infrequently on them, but it's more focal. Um, it's not so diffuse as this. It's not focusing around the brain stem or the circle of Willis. Um, and so, and it behaves very differently than aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is by far the most deadly cause of um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. Um,
Intraventricular hemorrhage. So this uh, is considered another hemorrhage type. It's in the ventricles, right? So here in the lateral ventricles, there in the fourth ventricle, you can see blood. Here in the third ventricle, blood. You already know this, right? That is not blood. That is the pineal, and that is not blood. Um, if you could scan up and down and you had a cursor that could measure Helmsfeld units with your um, uh, program, you would see that this is the same density um, as the skull or similar density as the skull um, instead of blood. Um, and so uh, interventricular he uh, hemorrhage, this can cause obstructive, this can cause hydrocephalus, right? So these patients can get into big trouble too. A lot of times when you see interventricular hemorrhage, um, it, it can be due to something like an aneurysm, um, a ruptured aneurysm, but um, uh, more commonly, it's due to an intraparenchymal hemorrhage that ruptures into the ventricles. So we talked about how there are two, well, there are more like five different locations, but the two most common locations for um, hypertensive um, intraparenchymal hemorrhage are basal ganglia and thalamus. And you can see if you have um, a hemorrhage in the basal ganglia or a hemorrhage in the thalamus, it would be very easy for that blood to just spill over into the ventricles. So when you get a patient like this, uh, you got to watch them for hydrocephalus. We'll talk more about hydrocephalus. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk about hypodensities today. You know what? Um, I think this is a lot of information. Let's hold here, especially because, um, you know, for uh, neurosurgery, bleeds is a good place to start, and will give you a good foundation as you start to look at scans. Um, but I'm going to record this a little later, um, hypodensities on CT, so it's a little more tolerable. And then we'll talk about some of the things that are hypodense on CT obviously, because that's the title of the talk. Um, I hope this gives you a little bit of a foundation. I know there's a lot to know. I know it's really overwhelming, and I know you look at these scans, and you're like, well, I don't know what's going on. Um, but I'm hoping that this gives you a start on, on how to communicate about things, what to start looking for, um, and hopefully also makes things a little more interesting as you are looking through scans or, or reading stuff. Like I say, we're going to go through some scans um, together when we meet on Thursday. Okay, 30 minutes, that's pretty good. Um, study your hyperdensities, uh, practice your lingo, and we will follow up for more neuroimaging. All right, thanks, everyone.